thank you so much, Mary. And uh, Mary's been with us as a accompanist for over 15 years and uh, blessed us. And I know recently our, uh, our personnel committees recognized that. She, you'll notice her title is our senior accompanist. And uh, she does so much and one of the most gifted accompanist I've ever worked with. So a real blessing to the Lord. And I'm thankful for her every day. Well, uh, obviously, we're into a new year, aren't we? <clears throat> 2019, did you ever think we'd get here? <clears throat> but we made it. I guess way back, gosh, it was maybe 1980-something, and, you know, 2019 just sounded like a place I'd never get to. It sounded so far off, and yet here we are. And what I'd like to, to share with you today is my desire for us as church of a Fairview Baptist Church. And that is, I'd I love for us to focus this year on growing as disciples of Jesus Christ. A year of discipleship. We'll still be focused on evangelism. We'll still be focused on missions. We'll still be focused on ministry. But I really want each of us individually and then We'll come together as church to focus on growing more as disciples of Jesus. And all of these other uh, ministries are going to grow uh, as we do this. So let me talk a little bit today about a little bit of my vision for that and what it, being a growing disciple of Jesus is. Now, the, it, when you read disciple in the Bible, especially the New Testament, the New Testament word in Greek for disciple is mathetas, mathetas. Now, I'm sure that the first part of that uh, word is M-A-T-H, math. Sure, it's where we get some of our, our, our math or mathematicians from, but the word literally just means being a student or an apprentice of someone or of some philosophy that is in the world. I'm sure glad it doesn't mean being a student of only math or I would never make it. And maybe some of you would not either. But in Jesus' day, when the New Testament is written, uh, many groups, some individuals had disciples, didn't they? They had learners. The Pharisees had their own disciples, those that learned under them. The Sadducees had their disciples, those that sat and learned under them. Uh, the Gospels tell us that uh, John the Baptist had his disciples that were really learning under him until Jesus came. And so simply, disciple means a learner. Now, when we put Christian disciple, when we put Christian in front of that, and we look at discipleship uh, from uh, the New Testament perspective, what I think that means, to, uh, the Christian disciple is a person who believes in and has surrendered their life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Christian disciple, we have believed in and surrendered our life to the Lordship of Jesus. And when we do that, there is this pathway of growing as disciples of Jesus, as learners of Jesus. Uh, the New Testament says our ultimate goal is to become mature in Jesus and more mature every day and every year until the day we see Jesus face to face. And on that day, we'll know everything completely. But until then, Jesus is our guide. Jesus is our example. Jesus is the one we're to be following. So what, maybe in, in three steps, there's many more, what's the pathway to discipleship? How should we be going? Well, the first step, the first step in the journey is to be a disciple of Jesus, we need to believe in Jesus. That's where it begins, doesn't it? It begins by believing that Jesus is the Son of God, 
It begins by us surrendering our lives to him. By not only Jesus is God's son, but we believe he came to rescue us, to save us from our sin. To save us from ourselves, that, that the human race, from the beginning of time when we could make our own choice, we had just been messing things up, hadn't we? And we look around, and the world just ain't right, is it? And we tried all kinds of politics, all kinds of government, all kinds of solutions, but we still have disease and war and poverty and sin, people doing horrible things to one another. And the Bible teaches us that only God can make things right. Only Jesus, his son that he sent, is going to, in the end, make this world right. And one day we know Jesus will come again, and it will be made right forever. But the only way to make things right in our soul, to be forgiven of our sin and get on the path and get working with God to make things right, is to believe in him and make him our Lord and our Savior. Jesus spells this out and even gives a description of discipleship that this is the beginning in a verse many of you know, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verse 23. I'm going to be moving around in Scripture this morning. Move around with me. Draw your swords, as they used to say. A little Bible drill to practice. But Jesus said to them all, Luke says, if anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. We've heard that if we've been believers a long time, haven't we? Three things. A person must deny themselves, just what we talked about, to say, I cannot take care of the spiritual, eternal problem that I have on my own. I cannot take care of the sin issue. I've got to realize, I've got to finally admit, I cannot do it. Then we have to take up his cross daily. We have to confess, believe, put our burdens, put our sin upon Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. And we need to remember that every day. And then we're ready, Jesus says, the next step is we must follow him. We must follow him. He says, he says something very contradictory, it sounds like to us, in verse 24. He says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And you try to, to uh, win this spiritual battle on your own and save your own life, you're going to lose the battle and the war, aren't you? The only way to win, the only way to be saved is to lose yourself in Jesus. And that's the beginning of discipleship, our commitment to follow him. Now, it's not only that easy that after believing Jesus for forgiveness of your sins, discipleship Jesus then says to us, it means uh, committing to him and make him Lord of your life. And to do that, you've got to count the cost. You've got to count the cost. You've got to realize that it's not going to be an easy journey to be more like Jesus. It's going to take discipline. And many people do not want to do that. Another area in Luke, Luke chapter 14. We're going to begin with verse 25. Jesus is going to say some other things that just whoop, make us open our eyes and say, what? This is different. Verse 25 begins and says, Now large crowds were accompanying Jesus and turning to them, he said. In other words, uh, Jesus was becoming kind of a, a rock star there in Galilee, wasn't he? Man, he was healing people. No one had ever seen that. He was teaching great things that nobody had heard in a long time. He was exercising demons and bad spirits from people. He was changing his society. 
and God's power was with him. And people wanted to be a part of that. They say, that sounds pretty good. And they flocked to him because they wanted to be near. This looks, this looks great. Let, let's get near this guy who's doing all these miraculous things. And maybe something will rub off on us. It's easy. We'll just kind of stay near him, follow him around. And our lives will be perfect too. And Jesus knows that there was not all heartfelt commitment in that crowd, didn't he? And so he continues on. He turns to them, and what does he say? Very interesting, right? He knows, if anyone comes to me, believes in me, becomes my disciple, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple disciple. That's pretty harsh on the front end, isn't it? Does Jesus want us to hate our family? No. But what he's saying here is that when we follow Jesus, he has to be number one in our life. And he uses the ultimate example, because for most of us, our family is the most important thing in our life, isn't it? But I think that that uh, and I know that Jesus would say that if we, if we make him number one, if we seek first his kingdom, all these other things will be added to us. That if we make him Lord, if we put him first, we're not going to hate our father and mother and sister and brother and husband and wife. Those relationships are going to become even better and deeper. We're going to be better husbands and dads. We're going to be better wives and moms. We're going to be better grandparents. We're going to be better brothers and sisters. But it's going to be if we make Christ first and then let the other things follow in life. And so Jesus says to into this crowd, he wants them to make sure they're counting the cost of what it's going to mean to follow him. For which of you, he says, wanting to build a tower doesn't sit down first and compute the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish the tower, all who see it will begin to make fun of him. They will say, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to confront another king in battle, will not sit down first and determine whether he is able with 10,000 to face the one coming against him with 20,000. If he cannot succeed, he will not send a representative while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, not one of you can be my disciple if he does not renounce all his own possessions. Now, this passage wasn't written how I've seen it tried to be used before to, to uh, use on a building campaign for church. That's not the kind of cost we're talking about here. He's talking about counting the cost of following him, isn't it? That, that there are going to be some difficult days, that there are going to be some challenges. There's going to be some moments and periods of guilt where we say, I haven't prayed enough lately. I haven't read my Bible enough lately. I need to recount the cost. This journey, this journey has to be dedicated, a dedicated journey. This journey has to be an intentional journey. And Lord, I know I'm gonna have to ask forgiveness for that sometime. And every now and then in our discipleship journey, as we get going, we're gonna have to sit down and, and count the personal cost that it takes to follow Jesus. We may have to give up some things. We may have to confess that other areas and activities of our life have become more important to us than Jesus. But we've got to count the cost, Jesus says. Don't be one of the large crowd. Be one of the ones that becomes my disciple. A long time ago, Martin Luther in the 1600s said this. I think it's still appropriate today. Luther said, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, 
and suffers nothing is worth nothing. Isn't that the truth? A religion, a faith, he's talking about Christianity, that gives nothing, that costs nothing, and suffers nothing, is worth nothing. Discipleship demands our all. And then, discipleship, secondly, overall, once we've made that commitment, we said earlier, is becoming more like Jesus. Living as a disciple is to develop a love affair with our Lord, a love affair with Jesus. It's, it's to grow in your desire, to, to really desire to study God's Word. It's to really desire to spend more time with Him, to pray to Him and with Him. It's our desire to become more intimate with Jesus, to get to know him on more and more of a personal level. It's to become more like Christ every day. That's the next step of discipleship. Jesus says in Luke 640, a disciple is not greater than his teacher, but everyone when fully trained will be like his teacher. A disciple is not, never becomes greater, but when they're fully trained and mature, they'll be like the one they follow. We'll become more like Jesus. I love how Paul in Philippians 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 10, kind of gives a, a summary of, of his desire as a disciple of Jesus. He gets personal about his faith. And his desire, his aim, he says, may be good for us to hear. Philippians 3.10, Paul says, My aim is to know him, to experience the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings, and to be like him in his death. And so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Isn't that a great description of following Jesus and discipleship? To know him, my desire is to know him, know Jesus. To discover the power, to experience the power of his resurrection. Now, we can be powerful in this world, and some people think they're powerful by positions they hold or by the money they have. But can you think of any greater power than the power of God to raise Jesus from the dead. And that power, the Bible says, is available to you as you get to know Christ more. And Paul says to share in his sufferings that when, when he does suffer for Jesus, when things don't go well, that he's sharing those Jesus has suffered too. And can we ever suffer as much as one that was nailed to a cross? the most wicked form of execution ever created. I haven't suffered that much yet. None of my sufferings even match what Jesus went through. And yours? What a goal of discipleship to have that attitude. And finally, to, to somehow, and Paul, it's a mystery to Paul, to us as human beings, to attain the resurrection from the dead, to have the hope of the resurrection that's true, a hope for us, a hope for our family, and the hope for our family that's gone on before us, that the resurrection of the dead is real, and we will continue on to be with the Lord forever. To be more like Jesus, that's our goal. It said the wife of, of the great missionary, Adoriam Judson, she came to him and and said, told him that a newspaper article had likened him to some of the apostles. He was doing so well. That's big praise, isn't it? Judson replied, I don't want to be like Paul, a mere man. I want to be like Christ. I want to follow him only 
copied his teachings, drinking his spirit, and placed my feet in his footprints. Oh, to be more like Christ. To be a disciple means we admire other Christians and great men and women of the faith, but we really don't want to be like them because they fail. They sin. They're not God. We want to be like Jesus. That's our model. And you know, this is the heart of my desire for you, the believers at Fairview this year, is that the end of the year, you can tell and know that you're more like Jesus than you are right now. Think about mentally, silently, where are you on a scale of 1 to 10 being like Jesus? And what the Bible promises is that if you spend time with him and love him and are intimate with him and learn about him and follow him, that by the end of the year, if you're at a two, maybe you could move to a three <laughs> or a four. Or if you're at a nine, come and talk to me. We've got something to talk about. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but wherever you are on that scale, you know, it's the inch along, isn't it? until one day we see him face to face in glory and we become like him. That's my goal. And then finally, big picture, discipleship thirdly is leading others. Finally, disciples lead others to Jesus and teach them how to grow in Jesus. From the, the very beginning when Jesus called the first disciples, those fishermen mending their nets on the shore he calls them, and he says, follow me, and I will turn you into fishers of men. He gave them the end result, didn't he? He didn't say, follow me, and I'll make you a great deacon. You know, I'll make you the most powerful person in the world. I'll, I'll uh, change your life, and everything will be good. But I want you to become fishers of men. Share with others about me. In fact, after the, the, the Gospels, and when you begin reading the book of Acts, I would say the majority of time, maybe never again, are those 11 that remain, and Paul, they're not called disciples anymore, are they? They're not referred to as those who just learn, who sit at the feet of a great teacher. They're now called apostles, apostolos. Those who are sent, their titles change. And that's what happens with disciples. They keep growing to be more like Jesus. We become ones who are sent to tell others about Jesus. That's the ultimate goal. We know, we, we read it often here at Fairview, Matthew 28, the last words of Jesus as the resurrected one here on earth, Jesus came up and said to them, these are his believers, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's our end goal. And that's another goal for we at Fairview. I hope every believer here grows this year in your confidence, in your courage, in your commitment, in your opportunity to share Jesus with others that you learn to invite others to church often, that, that you discover other believers and, and help them along this journey that we're on. Now, we begin this journey of discipleship, January and February. We begin next week by hopefully reading and discussing together at the little book, I Am a Church Member. And I ask you to do this our leadership was asking you to do this. And as we do this, here are some of my goals as we study this together.
and discuss it. I hope that every member will participate, that every member will find a small group. We listed them for you in the color worship folder today. Different times, different opportunities. That second, I, I hope that you will read and discuss this study as if you're looking in a full-length mirror. And who do you see when you look in a full-length mirror? Yourself. Don't want you to read this and discuss it as if you're looking in a picture window of your neighbor's house. <laughs> this is not about them. It's about you. It's about me as I read. I hope that you will grow in your knowledge and your understanding of what it means to be a biblical church member. Biblical church member. I hope that it will replace maybe if, if we have gotten turned around. I don't want you to discover again what, it, what you think it means to be a, a church member as defined in the 20th and 21st century, even in our own country. I want you to discover what God intended for a church member and who a God wants a church member to be. I hope you'll commit to change in the areas God convicts you about, and they'll be different for all of us. And that you'll find someone to share some of these new biblical principles you've learned. You'll share them with somebody else and help them grow. So we begin. We begin whenever your small group begins this. I'll be preaching on you are a church member. And uh, this was an easy one. I don't mean to step on your toes, but I can't promise I won't in the weeks to come whatever God leads us to say. So I encourage us, let's all join in this 2019 discipleship journey together. Let us all look forward to the challenge of this, to the learning of this, and to the joy of following Jesus. It's a joyous time. What better thing to commit to than learning and following and loving Jesus together. We will see a difference. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word, for sharing with us the truth, the truth about following you. As now we continue on our journeys of discipleship, we, we just commit together to grow from where we are to be more like you. Give us strength, give us courage, give us wisdom. We ask you in your name, amen.